Hey guys, welcome to another interview here at bringspark.com. You know, I started this website and this project because I wanted to bring out a website, a place for people to come to find inspiration or knowledge or insights into different aspects of life and how to achieve things and how to develop the different areas that you want to develop in your life. And obviously, I'm not the first person to do it. And the guy that I'm talking to today, he's been doing this for a long time. He's the co-creator of The Art of Charm, and he's the host of The Art of Charm podcast, which has about you know, 1.3 million listeners a month. It's it's listened to in over, almost 200, 100, sorry, in different countries. They're up to almost 400 episodes. It's an amazing place. And I met him a few years ago when we were speaking at the same conference. And and I'm really happy that he's here today because he's got a lot of interesting stuff to share with us. Jordan Harbinger, thank you for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. And but do we meet in Norway or do we meet in the United States? You know, I was thinking about that and I couldn't remember where we first met, if it was at the Morton Hockey Conference or if we met in, in the States before that. And I don't I just remember it either. <laughs> yeah, I actually have no idea. That's kind of funny. I feel like you came over one time. I, but I don't know if that's the first time we met or not. It's, it's all such a blur now. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've, I've been there a few times, but I can't remember the order, the chronological order of our hanging out. Yeah, me neither. Hanging out. But can I, I got to give you props because it just, I just realized that English isn't your, your first, I mean, I remember that English isn't your first language and there's no, no way, as good as I am at German and, you know, Serbo-Croatian, there's no way I could do what you're doing in a foreign <laughs> language. So I have to give you major credit because I, I, you're so good at it, it didn't, I didn't even think about it until just now. And I was like, wait a minute, English isn't even your first language. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm sure I have more, more uh, experience practicing my English than you, your, your German or whatnot. And possibly uh, also but, my yeah. English. Yeah. <laughs> Let us uh, jump into the Art of Charm podcast sure. at first, because that's a really interesting and amazing project that you've been doing for a lot, long time. Sure. Uh, could you tell us about it? Just like in a nutshell, we're going to get back to how you went about creating it and how it came about. But I want to hear about uh, what is it, why did you create it, and who's been on there? Sure. So the Art of Charm podcast is, is the show I've been doing since with my co-founder, AJ, since man, like 2006, late 2006, early 2007. We inter It started off as we used to call it the Pickup Podcast because it was about picking up girls right back then. And we interviewed all the, the top dating guys and stuff like that. But ever since then, we've kind of evolved it to include a lot more of the same types of folks that you'll see on, on this, on BrinkSpark, because it just happened to be that as we evolved in the dating space, we realized, oh, you know what really works to meet girls? Having an awesome life. And then it was like, okay, let's figure out how to give that appearance. And it's easier to just actually create an awesome life than to like figure out all the PUA tactics to make people think your life is awesome, which is just right. like empty and hollow. And so we started really focusing on that. And that became the new obsession where it was like, oh, wait a minute, let's not not attack the symptom which is that there are like not enough women in my life or whatever or you know not enough relationships in my life and start attacking the real cause which is lack of networking skills lack of personal passions uh, drive hobbies things like that 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 really create the amazing lifestyle and then once those things started to fall into place and by fall into place I mean like after a ton of work uh, come into place then it was like oh girls everywhere whatever afterthought you know and then relationship management of course being another totally different skill set that we also talk about at right. the out of charm and you guys have had a lot of, of different types of guests on there because it seems like every time I, I see a new episode there's yeah. something new that I almost hadn't even thought about before and and how can you stay fresh now can you bring in all these people after all these new episodes that you guys do that's a really good point um that i that a lot of people ask me and and it's this the answer is like so boringly simple people always go how do you know where to guide your brand you know how do you figure out what the best uh guests are for your show and you know how do you know what's going to trend well on the art of charm and and the 100 percent honest to god truth is that it's there there may be a little bit of secret sauce and i mean like one percent like a droplet of secret sauce in there but really it's i'm sitting at home one night my my tech guy texts me and says hey man turn on national geographic and there's some guy on there and i'm like oh that guy's cool and then he's like yeah you should interview that guy and i'm like oh yeah i can do that so i'll i'll <laughs> interview some private investigator or something like that and i'm like that was really cool. That was really interesting. And my audience goes nuts for it. And yeah. so basically it's, what am I interested in? 
okay, well, me being a generally normal human male, uh, anything that I'm really stoked about is going to be interesting to maybe 1% of the male population equally as much as me. Like, they're really going to find this guy fascinating. So I don't have to find, and I don't want to find, something that's broadly interesting to as many five billion people i don't want that because that's that's very general um i want somebody that's going to be maybe polarizing maybe i'm getting an email why'd you interview that guy such a douchebag and then another guy oh that guy's so full of crap and then 10 other emails wow that where do you find these people and so it's all about the brand is guided by what am i reading what am i watching what am i trying to learn because if i'm focused on that and i'm just a generally normal average Joe, then other people who are similar to me are gonna find that same thing interesting. And I think the reason that a lot of folks fail is they overthink it. And even if you look at branding like Tim Ferriss, for example, he interviews really interesting people that nobody's really heard of because he's digging really deep into like nutrition and biology and things like that. If I'm doing the same thing, digging really deep into social skills uh, social psychology and phenomena of that sort, of that nature. It, I just have to find people who are doing that too. And and it's not, it's really not that hard. Where people fail is they go, I need to interview Jeff Bezos because otherwise, you know, that because people will find, so many people will want to download that. And the truth of the matter is they don't care because they just Google Jeff Bezos and there's 18,000 pages of Google results before your show that have an interview that's better than the one that you exactly. did. <laughs> exactly. And, and it feels to me like that's one of the things that, that set you, you apart from a lot of the other podcasts out there is that, you know, you find you find unique content there. And it's not just I mean, you, you've had some big names on there. But even then, it seems like you're talking about not their their specific, you know, big topic, mm -hmm. but other other stuff that, that people don't hear that much. And if they do Google them, they, they won't necessarily find that piece of information. Exactly. Yeah. Like the just to give people a general vague idea, like. For example, the guy just interviewed or just released, I didn't just interview him. Uh, he's a private investigator who finds missing people, whether they want to be found or not. And he talks about, about fraud and scams and how it works and how the people who commit fraud and scams find victims. And, and like everybody wants to know, am I, oh man, do I have any of those traits? I interviewed another guy who's he's just a copywriter. I mean, he's a funny dude. Nobody's nobody famous, nobody special. His name's Nev Medora. Uh, and he talked about crashing parties because one of the ways that he expands his network, or at least used to before he was better at what he does now, <clears throat> was he would walk into like an Oscars or SF South by Southwest after party and he has all these cool hacks like wear a tux, carry a wine glass and, and be on your phone and be like, hey, I just came in from that thing. It's like, well, he's got a wine glass. He didn't walk from his house with a wine glass. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> uh, right. And so he would get into these parties in a tux and then he'd be like, oh my God, there's Mark Cuban, I'm going to go talk to him. And, and that kind of thing is really thinking outside the box, but in an actionable way, that's, I think, the one thing that sets the show apart is I will always find something actionable. I don't want someone to say, blah, 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 be inspired. I don't need to be inspired, dude. I'm, I'm motivated. I got motivation for days. I need to find out how to do something. I don't want to figure out, you know, I don't need to, tips on getting out of bed in the morning. I need tips on getting ish done because that's what we're here to do. And and I know that a lot of the people listening to this are the exact same way. They don't need tips on like staying motivated. Like we entrepreneurs, people who buy this, who are putting their time and money into this, those we're the most motivated motivated people in the world. Um, we just need to learn from other people that have thought of something that we haven't thought of. That's what we need. Not uh, not tips on the latest and greatest like method of, of uh, you know, SEO garbage. Like there's a lot of people that really focus on that. And I think to their detriment. And that's why really the long answer to the short question that you asked, how do we do the show is we just pick stuff we're interested in and then ask the same questions we would ask if that person was sitting in our living room and we could ask them anything. That's perfect. And, and you talk a lot about uh, lifestyle or, or you did, you, you mentioned lifestyle a lot and and you know being motivated doing stuff and you said that right. you're motivated and you're out there and you're looking for stuff and you personally have had a lot of interesting experiences in your life yeah. you know 
I mean, uh, just to mention a couple of the things that I know that I would love for you to, to jump into for a few minutes is uh, you've been kidnapped before, like not not just driven down the street, but properly kidnapped. Right. You've vacationed, if we can call it that, in North Korea several right. times. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you end up in these situations? How do you get to that point in your life? What What's your life been like and how has it led up to, to all these things? Yeah. Um, you ever see that movie, Yes Man? with Jim Carrey where he can't say no to anything. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> a little bit, I'd say 20% that and then like 80% finding unique experiences that I think will broaden my horizons, if I can put it lightly. So uh, the, the first time, the first like kidnapping event was, I, you know, I was 20 years old, I was in Israel and I actually left Israel because there was this uprising that started in the city that I was living in, Jerusalem at the time and, and it made things a little bit dangerous in the city as a whole. So I left, I went to Egypt and everybody thinks, oh, you got kidnapped in Israel? Oh, okay, you got kidnapped in Egypt. Actually, I was in Mexico after Egypt because I went to Egypt thinking the whole thing will blow over in Israel, and it didn't, So, and it's still going on, actually. And then uh, I went to Mexico to take Spanish classes thinking, all right, I just have to blow off this semester because I was going to college in Israel. Uh, and then I was living in this, like, ghetto barrio, and I don't mean that, like, oh, Mexico's ghetto. I mean, I was literally living on, like, the roof of a house that had – a staircase that led up to the roof where there just wasn't a second floor and I was like sleeping on the roof. Uh, and this cab, I took this cab, turned out to be a fake cab and he drove me further outside the city and I was like, oh my God, they're going to kill me. Like this is before cell phones were really ubiquitous everywhere in the world. So this guy kept driving and driving and driving and I thought, okay, I know he's not lost, which is what he said the case was. He won't drive me back. He said he needs directions, but I asked to go to the center of town, which is like asking to go to the White House if you're in a cab in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he was like, no, I'm just going to stop in this like really sketchy building and ask for directions because my friends live here. And I was like, this is where 10 guys jump out and I get chopped up into little pieces or something. So there was a struggle in the car. Uh, obviously, I'm here. Not sure what happened to that guy. I ran back the way we came and realized, wow, you know, there was a lot of things I did wrong. This is, I was 20, so it was year 2000, you know, different story. But that was when I was like, holy crap, like I may have almost died. Now, on the flip side, there's a very good chance I would have just gotten robbed or something. But, you know, I'm not really willing to gamble with what could have happened there. Because, uh, you know, I, yeah, no, no reason you should ever think, I'm going to get out of this one just fine. You, you might not. Mm. Uh, especially nowadays, things that seem to have escalated a little bit now you get Seems like sold like, yeah. to Hamas or something right so you get sold to Hezbollah um and then the second time that I I got kidnapped I was actually working in Serbia as a teacher but I had a government scholarship from the United States Department of Defense and they were just convinced that I was a spy so the police were always looking for me to find out where I was living um and they kept showing up to the addresses I had registered but I was always like well I'm not supposed to rent an apartment alone so I kept saying I was living with friends and the cops would show up to the friend's house and they'd be like, let me see his room. And of course, there was nothing in there. I didn't own anything in there. And they were like, OK, you have to move. So I kept moving and eventually the cops caught on and then they, they found me at an event and they were like, OK, we got this spy. So that was a little bit of a hairier situation that I barely made it out of. Of, I would say, um, with Federa, who had a big mouth. But I was able to use a lot of the skills that were taught at the Art of Charm that are taught at the Art of Charm to generate rapport with the guys, to talk and get an idea of what their plan was, and then create an opportunity where me and my friend ended up escaping. So that was really good and a very, very close call. Um, and I'm still not sure what's going on over there in Serbia. I have to wait till, I wanna wait until I have a friend who works for the government or something and have him like look up my file, whatever files are on me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't think that would be you know your first uh, vacation spot uh, after an it, experience it, like that. It wasn't. It wasn't. In fact, my first vacation spot after that was indeed uh, North Korea, because they had just opened it up to Americans, and my friends and I were always joking about going. And they opened it up, and my friends like, I'm going. And I'm like, he's a ship captain, so he's always in Asia. And I was like, oh, I'll go next time. And then I was like, wait a minute, no, the yes man thing, right? So I was like, fine, I'll go. So I scrimped together my pennies. This is like, man, this is probably 2009 or something like that. And um, Art of Charm was really busy. And I was like, okay, I, I'm just going to do it. I need a vacation. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's going to be awesome. So 
we took up, surprisingly did not get kidnapped in North Korea, had a great time, <laughs> went back four times. The one place you would expect to be kidnapped, <laughs> and you're yeah, not. Yeah, and totally fine. And so now I actually run a company uh, on the side of the Art of Charm. Art of Charm, obviously, my major focus. I, I have another company that I set up that's actually being acquired um, that brings groups of Westerners to North Korea. That's If people are interested in that, because people always ask, it's how to go to NorthKorea.com. And we list all of our tours there and stuff. And we go like every month. I don't go every month, but um, we run tours there like every single month. And that's a fascinating place, especially from a social perspective, because the people have grown up with no Internet. They don't generally they just got mobile phones, but they don't dial outside North Korea. They've never seen Facebook. They've never seen Google. They don't have uh, a lot of like video games. Hell, they don't have a lot of things that we consider pretty basic. They don't drive around in cars for the most part. Um, they've never been outside their city. They've never been outside their country, obviously. Uh, so they just have a totally different way of looking at history because the history that they learn is different, uh, well, let's say, than the rest of the world. Um, they've got a lot of really different customs. And it's like going back to 1950, only you're in China. So it's pretty crazy and fascinating. And and it's, a, it's an interesting place to see. There's nothing else like it in the world. It's not dangerous at all because... Frankly, all the criminals are, are dead, um, so so you don't have to, or they run the ship, you know. So you, right. and, and they have better things to do than, than worry about a tourist. Yeah. So it's it's a fascinating place. But yeah, I mean, the opportunities that I have done, I, I feel like I've created for myself in a lot of ways, and but by mostly keeping an open mind. I know that sounds like a crappy tip, because but it, I feel like a lot of people get a lot of really good opportunity, and they go, yeah. Now it's just not a good time because I've got, you know, I just started a job and I've got this and I've got that and I've got this other thing. And it's like, those are legitimate excuses. However, they're still just excuses, you know, like, yeah, buying a house, having a kid. They're all great reasons to not do certain things or to do other things instead. However, I know a lot of people that had a kid and bought a house and said, this opportunity is not going to come around again. I'm just going to figure out how to make it happen. And they do. And that's the difference in large part between a lot of people that I know are very successful and I don't just mean financially, but they're successful, happy, interesting people and people that constantly feel like they have nothing going their way and they can't really control their 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 life. Life happens to them. You know, they had to buy this and they had to go do this and then they had to replace this and then they had a kid. So now they're stuck doing X, Y and Z very rarely. But of course, my circle of friends that I choose to surround myself with is very much like we're going to do this. Oh, and if that happens, well, cool. We pivoted and did that. And that. Maybe it's a Silicon Valley thing living up here in San Francisco, but people aren't afraid to be responsive to change. That's perfect. And, and was this the same kind of thinking you had when you decided to kind of go into business with for yourself or, or with your friend and, and create your own, you know, success and your own your own yeah, business? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question because for me, I'm trying to think like when when did we start? Um, you know, back in the day, our mindset was. This is a hobby. This wasn't like the Art of Charm, the podcast, all that stuff. It was never intended to be a business. It was always just us talking about the same, again, like I said before, the same things we were talking about normally, we just kept talking about them um, on microphones. And, and it, the reason we were doing the microphone thing is because people kept saying, man, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I was like, dude, I'm starting for the bar exam, which is the legal certification exam from the state of New York, which is one of the toughest tests in America supposedly anyway. Um, and AJ, my, my business partner was a cancer biologist and he's like, yeah, sure. I'll write a book right after I <laughs> sequence this DNA human genome, like that's right on my list, you know, I'll right. write a book about this crap. So we were like, we're not doing that. And then people were like, well, you should blog. And I wrote a bunch of blog posts and AJ was like, I, I'm not doing this. I've got ish to do it all day. I'm not doing this crap. I got to write lab reports. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we're not going to hire someone to write this. What do we do? And then AJ is a very big tech guy and a very big Apple guy to boot. He goes, hey, listen, there's this new thing. It's been around for like a year, maybe 18 months. It's called podcasting. Basically, we can just record stuff and put it online and people can download it. And we're like, oh, awesome. And he's like, and there's a rumor that they're going to make a phone that can download it. And I was like, that'd be kind of neat. Now, of course, everyone has those. And now, yeah. that's, you know, we rode that. Yeah, and everyone does podcasts as well. Yeah. It seems. yeah. Yeah, and we wrote that wave. We've been in the iTunes top 100 for the last couple of years um, in the U.S. music store. Like the whole the whole top 
100, not like the self-help category. And right. in fact, like often enough in the top 50, I think we're, you know, to, right now we're number 60. So, you know, to sort of compare, contrast, Tim Ferriss is number 30, 35, you know, we're number 50, 60. So it's kind of cool to be like right up against Dave That's Ramsey, awesome. you know, Tim Ferriss and, and guys like that who have like this massive audience as well um, to compete on and quote unquote equal footing with that is is phenomenal. And it gives us a really good edge to then have access to even more people that are going to be the types of people that we want to reach with our show. Um, Absolutely. So, and, and it seems to me like a lot of the top podcasts that I know out there, they're, you know, names like you just mentioned, and they kind of got there through huge successes with books or, or even TV and, and like, like stuff like that. Uh, how did you guys end up with such a huge show going from just being two guys who are recording your conversations to having, you know, the kind of program that you have now. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting because whenever I talk, like I'll, I'll talk to an author and they'll be like, well, you know, um, my, you know, we, we wrote a book and so our publisher is going to help us with this. And, you know, they know like James Altucher who also has a podcast and I'm like, cool. Well, um, let me know because, you know, James Altucher's show is, he probably got about half the audience that ours does. I'm not trying to be like snippy. I love James. He's actually a friend of mine. So, but it's just kind of funny to be able to say something like that. And they're like, wait, what? You know, and the, because you get to sort of toss in the conversation like, oh, no, yeah, we know that. Um, we're actually ahead of the game in that department. Granted, mm -hmm. I don't have a book or a blog. James will well, stop all over us. And we don't need one. And, and so it's kind of funny because it's one of the areas where it's Yes, you can come in with an outside audience and really launch strong in iTunes, but to keep an audience of people listening to you is a unique skill that takes a lot of time to develop that is very, very, very difficult. Uh, a writer who writes a brilliant book, like if you, if you look at a guy like Malcolm Gladwell, for example, great writer, wrote a ton of books. If he came out with a podcast, I would bet that it would launch very strongly and I bet that it would, uh, after a while, kind of fizzle because you have to have broadcasting skills. And if you if you have a blog and you want to do a, a promotional blog to promote your your new book, you can hire someone to do that. If you want a website to promote your new movie, you can or book, you can hire someone to do that. If you want a podcast, you would never hire someone to do your podcast for you. It would be hard. It would be almost impossible. They can't convey your voice any better than you can. And so, in order to develop a voice that people are engaged with, at the level that people are engaged with podcasters. It's very difficult. And podcasters, the audience, they're the most engaged on the on the web. According to like the internet marketer types who measure these things, people mm -hmm. who listen to podcasts are far more engaged than a blog reader. They're far more engaged than a, an email list subscriber. And that's the reason that a show that has, has you know, 1.3 million downloads a month can be an eight-figure business. Whereas if your blog gets a million downloads a month, you'll be lucky to be making a similar amount of money, even though you have that consistent web traffic. It, it's right. very, very difficult. It's a totally different game, and it's very hard to come in and start beating broadcasters, comedians, and performers at their own game because you wrote a book. It's it's nearly impossible. So that's what I that's what I really love about it. Right, and, and I mean, it makes sense to me too, because with the voice and with the you know the tonality and subcommunication that you can do through a podcast that you can't do through text. Right. Uh, I would imagine. Imagine that your audience has a very personal connection with you. Yes. So I'm, I'm sure when you meet people who listen to your podcast and not met you before, they they kind of feel like they know you, even though you know you've never met in person before. They do. In fact, there's a lot of people that every time I speak with someone on the phone, they're like, "Man, it's weird talking to you like in real time. You're responding to me, and and it's great. I, I actually like it, and I love the fact that people know so much about my life. I think it's really fun. Um, mm -hmm. Bloggers have something similar, but there's just, it's very different and very difficult for people to retain the same thing in a text format than, than you do with sound. It, it's an evolutionary thing. We, we don't retain right. things that we process in written format the way we process things that we've heard because we were born with ears and we developed language, right? So it's, it's different, especially written language is pretty new in the scheme of evolutionary psychology. Absolutely. So what would be your, your advice if someone came to you to ask for advice on, you know, they're, they're launching a podcast or similar and they want to figure out how to make it good and how to build an audience and how to, you know, create that whole thing that you've been able to create? What would you tell them? Sure. I mean, the first thing I say is that in terms of launching a podcast, I'm like the 
last guy, maybe not the last guy. I'm not the first guy you should ask because I haven't launched a podcast since 2006, right? So I don't know. I, I know a lot of basically trade secret about iTunes that I could and data because I have eight years of data uh, that I can share and, and help people with, namely like launch with more than one episode. In fact, three to four at the minimum so that people get hooked on your content. Uh, you'll want to give them a call to action, namely subscribe. Uh, don't worry about Twitter. Don't worry about Facebook. Don't worry about you know trying to get people to squeeze. You can tell them you're giving away something free on your website, etc. But truth be told, it's got to be edited and polished, but not overproduced. You don't need like the welcome to the art of charm. Like we had stuff like that. We right. tested it. It's crap. Um, we have an intro. It's pretty chill. It's pretty relaxed. Uh, I used to do it myself. Uh, and you want to have at the end of the day. You've got to balance entertainment with content because there's a lot of people that will listen and be like, oh, I don't like this show because uh, it's there's too much joking around and there's not enough content. And, and what we're kind of known for is like really strong content. So whenever I hear that, I'll write back to the person and be like, cool, what other shows do you listen to? Oh, um, none. Or they'll listen to like the five minute internet marketer update or something like that. And I'll say, what do you read? And they're like, nothing. And they just want some kind of very specific result. This is the guy who says, there's this one girl in my work and I have to have her because she's awesome and tell me how to get her. And when you're like, well, well body language, they're like, yeah, 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 F that, what do I say? And you're <laughs> like, you know, that's that guy. But when you see the, the true fans, they come back for the way that you interact with your guests. They come back for you and people, people buy you. And so you have to be cognizant of that the whole time. Like your content has to be there, but you're a teacher. When you're on there, you're a performer, you're a teacher. If you don't think you can do that, podcasting might not be for you. And and I say that with all the love and kindness that I can. I think there's a lot of people that have no business running a show. They run the show because they want to make money off of it. Podcasting generally is just a terrible way to make money. It's it's as bad or worse than blogging. Um, there, sure, there's people that make a lot of money doing that, but there's also a lot of people that make money in Hollywood being in the movies. So, right. you know, your odds are about the same, maybe even less. And uh, so there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do it. But if you love talking to people, you love teaching people things, and you're able to think for your listener, not just ask only the things you're interested in, not just ask only the, uh, the questions you you want the answer to but think for the person listening then you can do a really good show and and that's the trick the hosting skill set the ability to guide a conversation the ability to rephrase things clearly so that other people can understand them that's mm -hmm. huge you know if, if you're if you're overly complicated or you're gonna be doing inside jokes the whole time or you can't explain a concept that someone states that's really complicated and and basically explain that in layman's terms on that for the audience, you're going to be in trouble because people have low tolerance for that stuff. I mean, if you can't maintain that, then no one's going to listen to you, at least not for long. Right. So to try to sum up that in that way, what, what I'm hearing is simpler is better, not, you know, don't mm -hmm. overproduce things, don't overthink things and, and keep the, the level of, you know, complexity down to, to make it easy to understand and make it easy to remember as well as that uh, it's not about making money, it's not about being famous, it's about having fun doing what it is that you do. Is that what you're... Yeah, it's because basically it's a fine balance between doing the show for yourself, but realizing... Here's, here's, let me try this analogy, I'm making this up on the spot, so let's see if this works. It's like if you and I are talking, but we're cognizant that there's a 16-year-old kid in the room and we want him to understand everything that we're saying, right? So... You and I might be talking about something complex, and I might then rephrase it and bounce it back to you, even though you know that I know that I understand. Right. So, like, you're thinking, well, Jordan understood that, but I'll still reflect it back to you because I know that he's listening. And I'm doing that for every concept that's complicated, and I'm trying to make that whole conversation entertaining at the same time. That's right. a, it sounds easy, but most people cannot do it. And I couldn't do it when I first started either. And that's why most shows die because everybody thinks they're, well, most people think they're really interesting and most people are decently interesting. The problem is being interesting to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people at the exact same time. That's tough. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And and so do you have like a thought or a structure on what a good podcast should be? Like what should be in it and how should it be be structured or do you kind of free flow with it? Um, I think it's fun to to free it so, to so called like free flow. Um, but for, for me I I basically I have an introduction to the guest. So I don't do like where I read the bio. Um, you know, and you did a good job introducing me earlier. A lot of show hosts, what they do is they go, okay, uh, I need a bio. And then they look at a bio of me, me online and they go, Jordan Harbinger is the co-founder of The Art of Charm. And he has, you know, written 17 books since 1965 or whatever. And it's like, that's boring because it, it's not necessarily relevant to what we're doing. So one of the tricks that I do is when I'm introducing the guest, I say, all right, you know, tell us what you do. And then they'll introduce themselves and then later on, nobody will say, hi, I graduated from the University of Michigan with a BA in an integrated international right. commerce. Nobody does that. They say, oh, I'm Jordan, and I teach people how to be confident. And then you go from there and you say, yeah, that's that's actually really interesting, and that's why we had you on today. I mean, you've been to all these other countries, and you did exactly this, right? That was mm -hmm. really, really cool because most people <laughs> just don't do that. They read the bio, and they're like, all right, next data point. <laughs> right. This is an entertainment edutainment right educational entertainment people mm -hmm. don't listen they they think they're listening because they want to be educated on these topics they're not doing that they would watch a youtube video where you taught them in five easy steps they're listening to this they're watching this because they want to be entertained at some level but they want the whole grain version they want the 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 nutritious green smoothie version of entertainment right. otherwise they'd just be watching like something on Cinemax right now yeah. instead. They want, they think they want the knowledge, but really they want their morning drive to go by faster. That's what they really yeah. want. <laughs> exactly. And, and it seems to me that uh, a lot of people who watch uh, or listen to, to podcasts or even watch like educational TV shows and stuff, they're looking to kind of feel like a part of it, even if they're not. Right. So, cause, cause it seems to me that all the most popular shows, whether it's podcasting, radio shows, TV shows, or whatever that has to do with education and, and understanding, is very, um, should I call it collegial. Like, people are relaxed, the people talking are more, you know, hanging out and, and touching on the important points, but as you were you were pointing out, they're not doing the fact by fact, blow by blow right. type conversation, because they're kind of dull to listen to, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of shows in iTunes that should be popular that are run by smart people that can teach things really well and they're just they're not that good and they fail um and there's a mm -hmm. lot of pe people that do shows that don't teach anything and those are the most popular shows some of them in itunes comedy right. is the most popular section in itunes it's not just because there's more comedy shows it's because people people who are comedians are really good at being entertainment uh, entertaining in an audio only format they don't have to be Absolutely. seen to do it and that's not a co coincidence so I'm not saying you should try to be funnier than Adam Carolla and Dennis Miller. You're not going to maybe be able to do that right away. However, if you can, the angle that we took is let's educate people and also be a little bit entertaining. Now you've got a winning formula and everybody's winning formula is going to be a little different. There's a lot of entrepreneur podcasts out there that are seemingly popular, but are actually struggling to continue to maintain and grow their audience because they're purely knowledge-based and they're short and they're like, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite this? Da, da, da. The, the turnover rate for a show like that is tremendous. People listen, get addicted to it for a week and then go screw this and then bounce or they listen to a handful yeah. of their favorite episodes. So it's, it's very, very interesting to see these patterns in iTunes. I would say when, if you're going to start a show, start the show for yourself. You know, Get access to cool people, have conversations with your friends, realize there's an audience behind it and then eventually you'll find that you're either delivering value to other people and you should keep doing it or you'll get bored and tired of it and move on to something else. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to do it for a yeah. month and then be like, meh, I'm good. Absolutely. And it seems to me there's a, a kind of a pattern in what you're telling us as well because you started by saying that, you know, the Art of Charm podcast uh, was created by, you know, an interest in having these conversations. And you were tell telling us that the guests that you had on were people that you were interested in talking to and this whole thing seemed to have spawned out of you and, and, of course, your business partners. Just love for exploring different topics and, and doing what you do and having fun with it. So what was it 
was, or was there a specific thing that motivated you to actually make this a huge thing instead of you know some a part time thing to to play with? That's a good question, uh, actually. And so what happened was I was working on Wall Street. I was an attorney, and I had found I had this guy who hired me. He was just like a baller. He made a ton of money, and he was never in the office. And I remember asking him like, "How come you?" make a bunch of money, but you're never around, you know, and, and this is before I'd started the show. And he was like, well, I bring in all the business. I, I run the relationships between us and the clients. And I was like, well, I'm going to focus on that because if everybody else is sleeping under their desk and trying to put in hours, I'm going to figure out the, the leverage point, which he had, which was networking. Cause he had, he was from Brooklyn. He had a tan and I'm like, this guy knows what he's talking about. So, so like I started devoting as much time and energy as I could into like how to win friends and influence people and like networking and creating connections and things like that. And after a while I realized this was not only the strongest leverage point that I had, but it worked great with the opposite sex. And so I started really focusing on that and got kind of obsessed with it. And then people started writing in after we started the show and they're like, this is great. I've had a million matchmakers and dating coaches and you guys are better. And we're like, well, we're not even really like we're not coaches. You know, this is eight years ago before we started hiring people to teach us how to teach. Right. And we're like, well, we're not coaches. And they're like, no, trust me, uh, you are. I want to do phone coaching with you. So we started doing that for a couple of years. And then after a while, people were like, listen, I'll give you, uh, I'll pay your rent for this month if I can come stay with you and learn in person. And we were like, uh, okay, well, you can't stay for a month, but you can stay for a week. And that was how our week-long program started is because people kept doing that. And then we're like, okay, we developed a real curriculum. We hired coaches and teachers and consultants to, to craft it into something that people can learn and retain and it keeps evolving over the years and that's what we've crafted now at Art of Charm is that. And so after a while of doing that, I was like, wait a minute. All right, the market's turning down. I don't have any work in the office. I find myself spending all of my days in my law office working on Art of Charm. What am I doing here? So finally, when they asked everybody to find new jobs because the firm was closing due to the economy, I thought, all right, I can either get another job in the exact same type of industry that I don't care about at all, or I can start this company in Ernst, which it was already going on. I was coming home to the the team working without me. And I'm like, these guys are having the time of their friggin' lives. And I'm at an office all day and I'm looking at getting another job. No way. So I just quit. And I was like, listen, I've got startup capital. I've got money saved. Let's do this. And so then we started running AOC like a real business that it is mm. today. That, that, you know, that's eight years ago now and, and change. So, but it, it took a while and it was a combination. What forced us to go full time was a combination of economics. My job was winding down and the fact that we knew we were onto something because we were profitable and we weren't even trying to do business. Right. Exactly. And so it sounds like me to me, like all this was born out of your own interest and your own passion for, you know, just living your life the way that you want. And I know that's, you know, you, you teach confidence to people through both your podcasts and your programs and, and your business. And it seems to me like that's basically what you're doing. You're, you're living a confident life based on what it is that you really want and not necessarily following the path of, you know, the, the Wall Street lawyer and, and, and that. Bit of yeah, it. it was cool because I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I just kind of was. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm being given this like golden opportunity to get the hell out and do right. what I want to do. So again, it's back to the yes, man. It's like, am I going to give this a shot? Because if we failed, I would just like my, my outlook was pretty bright, delusional as it was. I was like, worst case scenario, I get another awesome Wall Street job that pays more than both my parents made at the peak of their career the first year out of school whatever, you know, like I'll do this for two years and if it doesn't work, like send everybody home and get a real job and it worked, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm looking back, I was like an idiot. It totally was a lot of luck involved, but then we made a ton of mistakes, but it's, it's kind of fun because it did work, you know? And, and it wouldn't have, if I had gotten that other job and tried to play it safe, things would have definitely, the wheels would have come off the car a long time ago and, right. you know, I'd be going, man, I should have done that. So to anyone who might be watching this and, and who want, you know, have that passion for something in their life, whether it's podcasting or starting their own business or whatever it is, but they maybe don't have the confidence or they're telling themselves, I need a safety net or, or whatever it is, what would you, what would be your advice to them? Um, you know, it's hard for me to make this decision for people because here's the thing. A lot of people think that 
they need the safety net, that they need to get the job. And that's a decision that only you can make. It, it, I don't know how risk tolerant you're going to be. I am obviously looking back on all the weird things that I've done in my life. Like I'm very tolerant to risk. Um, as you get older, the fact is that you will never be more risk tolerant than you are right now if you're young and you have no kids and you don't have a mortgage and you you aren't married you will never be more risk tolerant than you are now and what i mean by that is you could be broke and you could probably live at your parents house you could be broke and you could sleep on friends couches you could you could lose everything and go get some sort of like menial job to survive you'd be fine that's not going to be that you don't have that option when you have a baby you don't have that option when you're married and you have a house or a wife it, there's different considerations. If you are your only responsibility, you will never have a better time to start doing your own thing. I know a lot of entrepreneurs that started um, before they got married and they're they're like, this is great. I'm an entrepreneur. I spend tons of time with my kids. I know a lot of people that are trying to start businesses now that they're married with kids. And it's not that they can't. It's just that they've been going for four years and it's super slow going. I mean, it's just slow because they need to be the lawyer. 12 hours a day to pay for the wife, kids house, you know, and, and to live, then they can do the other thing on the side. Right now you could eat Chipotle three, twice a day and work out in your living room with a pull-up bar and a kettlebell that you bought at a garage sale. And you could survive that for five years. If you're 23, you, you could do that, but you would, who cares if you do that, right? You'd be fine. That's a lot of runway to invest and focus 24 seven and you have the energy for God's sake to focus 24 seven on your startup, your business, your idea, see if it works, see if it fails. You know, you can't do that when you're 40, even if you're single and you don't have a wife and kids in a house when you're 40, you're going to be friggin' tired at 9 PM, man. I'm 35. I get tired. You know, I'm lucky and glad that I did all the super intense, intense stuff in my twenties and early thirties, because I don't think I could do it again. I just don't have it anymore. You know, <laughs> I work my butt off now, but I, I don't have the 24-7 that I used to have. And I'm glad that I don't need that anymore. You know, I hire people for that. <laughs> uh, it sounds to me like you're saying that you see a big difference between being young and single and, and having not that many responsibilities and having all the energy as opposed to being older and maybe having a family, having responsibilities where you might have a bigger need for a safety net, something that can help you push through you know, the, the rough patch in the beginning when you're creating something. Now. Yeah, I think, but I don't want people to go, oh, well, I'm 38, so I can't do this. You can. It's going to take you longer. I mean, the upside is now you're so much wiser. You're older. You have a better support network. You probably know a hell of a lot more people than you did in your 20s. Um, you realize your own capabilities. You also know more about what you're interested in, what you want your business to maybe be, um, and you know that you know the value of hard work whereas I think young people kind of expect a return on investment for a lot of their, their time and effort if they've ever actually put time and effort into much of anything um, and so there's a lot of advantages to being older the difference the, the one of there's a lot of advantages to being older however having boundless energy tons of free time and no responsibilities are not the advantages that you have being older and I I can only speak right. to how it's done when I was younger, and I'm glad I did it that way. However, I'm sure there's just as many entrepreneurs that go, hey, man, no way. I'm grateful for my 10, 15 years of work experience. Uh, I'm grateful for the fact that I can lean on my wife's income while I start my thing. I'm grateful for the fact that I have this large network in my space because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you don't have to go from Wall Street to social skills and charisma and networking coach. Like That's a dramatic 180. You could go from... I'm a, I'm a lawyer to I'm someone who helps lawyers generate business on the internet. I mean, that's, that's a move that's this big. I, right. I, I made a move that was this big, <laughs> right? You don't have to do that. You can, you can do a little shift like that and then you're your own boss and boom, you know, you scale, you can do that. And I would, that's I would say if that's something that you have on the horizon, that's an easier move than deciding to become a, you know, join the circus when you're, you're 40 or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's great. Uh, I know you're a busy man. I know you have a lot to do today. I, I appreciate that you were on here a lot, and I'm hoping that sometime in the future we can get you back on and yeah. have you talk about some more of the, your your experiences and your knowledge because, you know, we've hung out a lot, and it seems to me like every time we talk, there's something new that you say that makes me go, huh, that's interesting. I never thought of that before. 
Well, great. So uh, hopefully we can get you back on here in the future as well. Would love that, man. This was fun. So I, I hope I wish you all the success in the world, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for being on here. Now you guys should go check out The Art of Charm. There's links on the site that you're watching this video on, and you should definitely check out the podcast. Subscribe to it because it's an amazing place, and, and it's been inspirational for BrinkSpark as well. So if you – if you like what you see on this site, you're definitely going to like what you see over at The Art of Charm. So thank you for watching.